And I would, well, I'm honored to, to have this talk on audio and maybe open some questions about the, the virtual acoustician's contribution of this conference. By the way, I would try to convince you about the importance of characterizing the listeners in an immersive virtual reality scenario. I will give you some insight of the state of the art framework for spatial audio technologies and a user study. And, but first of all, I'm trying to uh, briefly go to how we listen uh, in uh, our daylights. And uh, the, 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 the listening experience is a connection between the, the listener in space, so we can't divide the, the listener's acoustics from the, from the room acoustics. And in the, in the literature, we try to model as the binaural room input response. And in this kind of input response, we have a lot of information about the quality of the environment, of the quality of the interaction, and in particular how our uh, body um, interacts with the environments, producing localization cues from static and dynamic movements of sound sources and body. And, but if we want to model such uh, complex scene in the, in the immersive virtual environment, we should try to, to face the complexity of the sound propagation in space, how the sound source produced their, 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 their sound waves, how the headphones could be compensate, equalized, and then there's the listeners in the, in the environment that moves, we should track the listeners all the time, and we should know also how to uh, collect data about user characterization, both acoustically and non-acoustically, in order to scale down the rendering, the scale on the complexity. So the research question of my work is, what is the impact of this characterization, the quality of an experience in a multimodal VR scenario? And spatial audio in VR, yeah, it has a long story with a lot of tasks, especially for visually impaired people, searching visual virtual reality, assembly task, exploration, presence, game, a lot of uh, works on, on this field, but there are some relevant issues in scientific literature. We have no control most of the time of the the algorithms are outdated, they didn't consider the, the user acoustics personalization, and of course the characterization is totally absent. They are different and the contexts are different. So our user study, which in my opinion is one of the first in its kind, consider a real multimodal immersive virtual environment, and it's a first step towards a characterization of the listener in such kind of scenarios. Um, with short and short auditory screen test. And we should start from something, and uh, we decided to start with vertical localization. Why? Uh, yeah, I started working with vertical localization 10 years ago. Maybe it's one of the first reasons, but more recently, um, some of my colleagues uh, uh, discovered a connection between spectral matching abilities and elevation perception, which could be considered an, as an indirect measure of sensitivity to dynamic changes in spectral changes and for some measure of auditory plasticity of our users. So all those spectral information are in the so-called head-related transfer function, which has a dependency of the listeners, of course, anthropometry, the sound position in space. You should consider a full sphere characterization of the sound field around the listeners. And I'm proud to say that the, the first measurement setup for HRTFs, the, the first rigorous measure setup, was in my uh, university at Oldborough University in 1991 by Muller and colleagues. And then we can extract some acoustic information as localization uh, cues for elevation from, from, this, from the spectrum of this HRTF. And it's simple for me to explain to you by the um, a PINA model, an uh, external ear acoustic model, where we can consider the ears as a resonators, which has a resonator resonances depending of the direction of arrival of the sounds, and they, in the forms of peaks in the, in the, in the HRTFs, the, the red box and the blue box, the forms of notches caused by reflections in the PINA contours of the, of the, of the and at, at high dependency of geometry of the ears. So we came up four years ago with this 
HOBA framework, which is HRTFs on demand for binaural audio, which is basically a, a web uh, framework that allows people to have their personalized HRTFs on the, on the web browser. Uh, that the time it was quite a novel stuff. Uh, there, we, we, there are some efforts also in the, for the game engine in this, um, this direction. But this HOBA framework was integrated in an in a immersive virtual reality setup, um, considering a motion capture uh, that guides the avatar uh, body movements uh, connected to the user movements, and also uh, um, a very precise equalization of the headphones, and of course, uh, a procedure that is able to provide a personalization of HRTF. And in this uh, field, there are a lot of studies. Uh, I've recently published a paper on IEEE transaction of audio speech and language processing. And you can find um, an overview of the, the most common approaches. But all of them are based on the freely availability of uh, a lot of HRTF sets around. There are not, there are not, there's no consensus on how to measure them, but there are so many HRTF databases. And uh, in my work, um, I, I follow the approach to trying to find the best HRTF based on PINA images, external here uh, images. And then, uh, date back for to 2014, I. I developed the first algorithm that is able to predict uh, central frequencies notches um, from the external ear contour from, of a two-dimensional image. And if you can notice, uh, the, um, we can have localization accuracies, like the, the plot on the left with a dummy head, a flat, uh, flat line means no elevation cues. And then with personalization, we can achieve the, the same level of, uh, let's say, a, a, a perceptually relevant elevation cues selecting by uh, a, a predefined non-individual HRTF set. And we developed this screening test. It follows a, local, a standard localization test in Unity and where we have 25 sound sources and people have to localize one by one and randomize, of course, order. And uh, we computed the errors. The, 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 the procedure took five minutes. And we got these 12 participants. Then we can compute those low values for the elevation angle, uh, elevation uh, perception. And we can group uh, participants based on their performance in elevation. And we can see that there, in, the, in, our, in our pool of subjects, there were six subjects that has good localization and, and six not. And we can also try to find a motiv psychoacoustic motivation, uh, which is uh, connected with the minimal audible angle in the median plane. So we can s divide it, those groups according also to such a psychoacoustic motivation. Uh, also with the statistical um, meaningful results of the, of the slope line regression, the, slow, the, la the linear regression. Um, and then we also, uh, put those subjects in a two minutes free exploration of virtual environments. We uh, try to identify some choices for the design of virtual reality. We, we, we try to avoid background noise, uh, room acoustics, uh, and we randomized the, 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 the five audiovisual so sources in a three predefined configuration, and we used uh, the ecological navigation solution, which was the walking in place. And we came up with something similar to this scenario we, with a strict area where people can walk around. And we follow a within subject experimental design in order to see if the audio rendering condition has an impact in the, in the experience. We consider the panning, the two-dimensional panning solution, uh, a three-dimensional um, selection of a the trivial selection of a dummy head acoustics and um, HRTF that, is, that was personalized to the previous algorithm. Um, so after each trial that were, and the trials were randomized, they, people fill a short questionnaire about spatial presence, spatial audio quality, and, and attention. I don't want to go into the details of this short questionnaire, 
but we found no statistical significant differences where between audio condition. We tried also to group two dimension versus three dimension, and we didn't find any statistical significance. And interestingly, out of 12 subjects reported that there were elevation cues also in the two dimensional uh, auditory um, condition. So it's quite strange. We can definitely tell uh, that no distinction in the rendering condition came up with our analysis. But if we split subjects based on their char user characterization, we can see that people with, they, with good localization performances perceive the, the system as more responsive with less latency. And we have also, uh, where they paid less attention to visual aspects. So we can say that individual modulations uh, exist. And yeah, the visual dominance is in, is high and also user in, a, in the conditions without a specific task uh, tolerate the auditory degradation for the auditory feedback and there is a, an, in, in the, a divided attention uh, based on individual characterization of our users and this is partially against previous works but they're so old I would say with the scenarios had less interactivity, fewer audiovisual sound sources, no animations, and a strong task dependency. So this, our project has, has a high ecological validity, and many studies should be replicated with state-of-the-art technologies, especially for special audio technologies. So at the end, do we need those screen tests? And yeah, uh, our answer could be yes, we should also try to identify individu other uh, individual sensitivities, um, a dependency on the context, on the task. And we started with localization, but next steps are, of course, spectral sensitivities, trying to define the, the confidence level of familiarity with semantics of sound in those environments. And of course, also the, the reaction time of uh, unexpected events in, in our environment, which is highly uh, indi an individual behavior or, or also physiologically speaking. And we should try to find approaches to optimize data collection of such screening data, for instance, like using games, but it's only one of the, of the, of the many possibilities. And system has to, to adapt to, to users and to context before performing any VR experience or experiment. And why not? The system, if it's able to, to know the, the capability of the user, can also help users and train uh, for a better active listening uh, in, in the, of, of their surroundings in real life, in their virtual reality and also in augmented reality. So our ecological Use cases could be, of course, longer, more complex, with re repeated exploration tasks. We, uh, we could also uh, explore different tasks in, in noisy environments, uh, understanding how room acoustic could in interfere with, uh, with, uh, with our results. Uh, and the final goal is finding new levels of accessibility. To, to audio and multimodal content. So the, the, the current and future developments for, for me and for my, my, my group is to try to fully customize the, the part of the, uh, for, for the user based on anthropometry for sure and, whole, and, and also try to understand how can we extract acoustically such listener specific information. And then also try to find individual parameter for computational auditory models that could guide the rendering of VR and AR scenarios. Um, and then, yeah, there's a big challenge in the technological support of immersive audio in uh, augmented reality. Uh, this is another story because it involves hear through devices, uh, scene analysis, uh, blind source separation, and so many other aspects. So, uh, thank you for for listening. So I hope that those those sounds good to you. And yeah, bye.
and you can find the framework in GitHub, as you notice on the, on the bottom of the slide. We do actually have time for one question before lunch. So at the end, you finished with augmented reality in, you know, scenario. Can you tell us more if there are current work in augmented reality, uh, augmentation of sound in, in the real environment? And do you know, I mean, what are the, what's the state there? Yeah, it, it's quite an, an odd topic in the, uh, it's more in the hearing aids industry and hearables, smart headphones. So there are all investments in, in this direction, but they are trying to, to, to build um, the, the technological background first, and very few, few works on the interaction that people can, can do with such technologies, because there are, let's say, uh, it's quite a black box, and only those companies have access to, to those. But yeah, the, in, in the, let's say, from the scientific community, we got some examples of such uh, technologies, but they were covered by patents and they, they didn't uh, rise to life. So, yeah. This is one, one related question to that. You know, you, this is really interesting. So if you localize, you know, do you think in augmented reality for, for audio augmentation, is the co-registration of sources of real and virtual as important as for visual? E, of course, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's something that it, um, it has to be, uh, that the researchers are not, there are not so many in this, in this field, but of course there are evidence that, that, that the, from the cognitive aspect that we um, elaborate the, the, the sounds in an individual basis. So if we are not able to provide those individual information, people can't localize sounds. And of course, in, a, in an immersive augmented reality scenario, I will expect that the vision will dominate the task because people can't, re, uh, can't rely on the, on the auditory information. So, the, 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 so we, we, we should try to, to reach the same also for with uh, auditory rendering experiences. Thank you. Okay, time for lunch. Thank you.